Cigarette smoking is the leading cause of preventable death in the United States. It causes serious illness among an estimated 8.6 million persons. It costs 167 billion in annual health-related losses, and it kills approximately 438,000 people each year. Worldwide, smoking kills nearly 5 million people annually. If current trends continue, this number will double by 2030 and smoking will kill more than 1 billion people during this century. Although smoking prevalence is decreasing slowly in the United States and in some parts of the world, it is increasing sharply in other regions and among certain populations, especially in developing countries and among women. This is despite the fact that health risks of smoking have been suspected and publicized since shortly after tobacco was first introduced to Europe 400 years ago, and these risks have been scientifically proven for at least the last half century. Smokers and their families and government entities have been filing lawsuits against tobacco companies for more than 50 years. Over these years, tobacco litigation has seen a number of changes from the theories of liability used by plaintiffs to the legal defenses mounted by cigarette manufacturers. For the first 40 years of litigation, the tobacco companies never lost the case. In the 1990s, plaintiffs began to have limited success in tobacco lawsuits partly because some cigarette company documents were leaked showing the companies were aware of the addictive nature of tobacco. In November 1998, the attorneys general of 46 states and four of the largest tobacco companies agreed to settle the state's cases in a master settlement agreement estimated at $246 billion to be paid over 25 years. In June, presented with the overwhelming evidence of the tobacco industry's deception, U.S. District Court Judge Gladys Kessler issued a landmark verdict that the major cigarette manufacturers are racketeers who engaged in a deadly fraud. In June 2010, the United States Supreme Court allowed Judge Kessler's verdict to stand. In her final opinion, Judge Kessler found that the tobacco company's wrongdoing continues. Their continuing conduct misleads consumers in order to maximize defendants' revenues by recruiting new smokers, the majority of whom who are under the age of 18, preventing current smokers from quitting and thereby sustaining the industry. Defendants have marketed and sold their lethal products with zeal, with deception, with a single-minded focus on their financial success and without regard for the human tragedy or social cost that success exacted. Today the Insider Exclusive goes behind the headlines in Tobacco Secrets Exclusive to examine how Steve Scheller, founding partner of Scheller PC, successfully devised an ingenious theory used by Judge Kessler to go after the tobacco companies claiming that the cigarette companies knowingly defrauded consumers and sought an injunction regarding light or low tar and nicotine cigarettes. Steve focused his arguments on state consumer protection statutes and knowing that the health issues of each individual would make it impossible to create a class action lawsuit but still wanting to bind groups of people together in their effort to punish the tobacco industry for its fraud he instead went after the tobacco companies for consumer fraud on the notion that consumers did not buy the kind of product they thought they were buying. Plaintiffs in these cases allege that the tobacco companies advertise light cigarettes as being healthier and safer than regular cigarettes when in fact they are no safer than non-light cigarettes. In fact, 60% of smokers believe the terms light and ultralight refer to low tar, low nicotine cigarettes. More than 160 countries have signed the World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which prohibits the use of descriptors that may create the false impression that a particular tobacco product is less harmful than other tobacco products. Research proves that light cigarettes deliver the same amount of tar and nicotine and carbon monoxide to smokers as standard brands, partly because testing machines do not burn cigarettes the same way cigarettes burn when actually smoked by a person. 
Steve's efforts resulted in a record-breaking $10 billion decision in Price versus Philip Morris in 2003, earning Steve the title King of the Light Brigade. On December 28, 2010, the Minnesota Court of Appeals ruled to allow a lawsuit to proceed that claims that manufacturers of marble light cigarettes misled smokers by marketing low tar as a healthier form of tobacco. The lights frauds could be the largest fraud perpetrated on consumers in the United States. The United States government took up Steve's discovery of key documents and strategy and sued the tobacco industry in Washington, D.C. And on June 22, 2010, the United States Food and Drug Administration took action to end one of the deadliest consumer frauds in history. It banned the use of deceptive terms like light, mild, and low tar in the marketing and sale of cigarettes in the United States. Steve's dedication to righting wrongs is ever present in his life's work. And because of that success and dedication he has had in the halls of justice, he has been continually asked to help some of America's most powerful people in making a positive difference. From Secretary Hillary Clinton and former President Bill Clinton to the 45th governor of his own home state, Pennsylvania, Governor Ed Rendell. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Steve for what he does in the public sector. Of course, first and foremost, he's a great uh, lawyer, he's a great family person, uh, uh, he, he uh, runs a terrific business, all of those things. But Steve loves politics, loves government, understands that with all its warts, it's the only way to get things done, to make real change happen in this country. But he just doesn't pontificate, he just doesn't sound off about what needs to be done. He puts his money where his mouth is, and he puts his energy uh, and his work product where his mouth is. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy, and this is the Insider Exclusive, live from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It is my great pleasure to introduce Steve Scheller to the show. Welcome to the show, Steve. All right, thank you. Tell our audience a little bit about the type of law that your firm practices. Well, we handle what are called mass torts involving dangerous drugs, dangerous products, uh, could be Vioxx, uh, where large numbers of people suffer injuries from uh, the products that they are using commonly in, in the public arena. And we also handle class actions uh, uh, with the goal of gaining benefits and protecting as many people as possible. Uh, our goal is to put a stop wherever we can to corporate greed and misconduct mm -hmm. and to help people who are in need, who usually can't get the kind of assistance we're able to give them. Today we're going to discuss one of those dangerous products, tobacco, right. which a lot of people thought way back in 1998 that tobacco companies were called to the carpet. They signed this master settlement where they paid 200, well they're going to pay 280 billion dollars or whatever it is over 25 years. Take us back to 1998 and tell us how the tobacco companies, the litigation that's happened, how you're involved with it, and what the tobacco companies have done to counteract that litigation. The, the litigation began in my, uh, with me and a large group of law firms. There were 50 or 60 of our firms. We were called the Castano Group at the time, and it was started by a very fine lawyer from New Orleans called Wendell Gauthier, who's uh, one of his close friends died <coughs> from lung cancer. Uh, and was addicted to uh, nicotine and smoking. <clears throat> he got, we got together and we decided we were going to find a way, uh, we hoped, to put a stop to this. So we began a series of actions uh, representing different states because state attorney generals wanted to also do something about it. There was a coalescing of forces at the time to try and deal with this problem of smoking and the huge cost that was uh, costing our health care system and many families who, or, uh, who had deaths related to, including my own uh, mother, frankly. She died related to a smoking. And it's one of the reasons I never smoked, I think, because I remember a time when she was smoking, got ashes on our, uh, our old 1950 Plymouth uh, cars, uh, car cloth and it burned the hole and my father went nuts mm -hmm. <laughs> for what happened. Uh, and I never smoked. 
uh, and and I understand the uh, the effects of it. So what we did is we got together, we began those actions. And we ended up settling them in 1998. We actually, our group represented the state of California. And uh, uh, we actually had a lead plaintiff, one of the lead plaintiffs in that case, who became governor of California, Gray Davis. Uh, and we, in fact, California, I believe, got $22 billion from that settlement, which is still being paid out to them. And time goes on, and during that litigation, I was, uh, pr primarily in charge of the Reynolds, R.J. Reynolds aspect uh, of the case. That's Winston, Cigarettes, Salem. And, and while I was doing, working on the case, I learned about uh, a case going on uh, of an, in some lawyers were trying to pursue individual lung cancer cases on behalf of people who got lung cancer, which was very difficult because the tobacco industry was doing everything as possible to make it expensive. Uh, to pursue the case and counter uh, the ability of a law firm to successfully litigate it. Because had those law firms been successful, we wouldn't be in the predicament we are today with our health care costs, frankly. Mm -hmm. So what happened is I'm helping out in this case, and a particular um, uh, research director for R.J. Reynolds named David Townsend uh, was testifying. <clears throat> and he identified the amount of volume of smoke a smoker takes in during uh, the time he's, when he smokes a single cigarette. And he said it was 500 to 600 milliliters of smoke, which is the way they measured it. At that time, the federal government actually measured our nicotine for the uh, cigarette companies, which uh, was another interesting aspect of these cases, how they managed to get that done. But they only measured 35 milliliter puffs and no more than 8 to 10 puffs for cigarettes. So the average smoker, according to the federal government, was only smoking 350 approximately milliliters of smoke. And I heard Townsend say, well, it's actually 500 to 600 milliliters, which means essentially you got twice the amount of nicotine that they claimed you were getting in the terms of the measurement. And I began looking at that from that point forward. And I was d uh, I decided to depose a previous research director for R.J. Reynolds named uh, David uh, Alan Rodgman. And I subpoenaed his records, because uh, he no longer worked for the company, but he was being paid, I think, $3,000 a month. I'm not sure for what. Uh, Keep his <laughs> mouth shut. <laughs> and ap obviously, it seemed to be the case. Mm -hmm. And I'm deposing him, and I subpoenaed his, him at night at his home, and he had his computer, and he still had documents. And he brings him into the deposition finally after we, by the way, had quite a fight to get him there with him. But he hadn't, and I stopped the deposition and began fumbling through nine boxes of uh, material. Now, in those days, we didn't, and this is, you know, 1997. And I found a document that he had prepared uh, uh, outlining the, what I call the light cigarette scam, which is probably the biggest scam that's ever been perpetrated on our uh, citizens. Uh, what that outlined is that light cigarettes are supposed to reduce your tar and nicotine, but he actually outlined how they didn't re <laughs> uh, So there it was in black and in white. In black and white. Not only yeah. didn't, but they were actually potentially more dangerous yeah. because their, the type of tar they produced was actually more mutagenic, in other words, more dangerous. And in addition, we learned that they used cilia stats and things like that to freeze your cilia so that when you smoked a light cigarette, you would end up inhaling the cigarette and holding the smoke in the lungs for longer periods of time because you didn't really feel the, the graininess or, and I wouldn't know how it felt because I didn't smoke, but I right. know that one cigarette I tried years ago was pretty annoying. Tell us what was real interesting in this document. Well, what was interesting in this document and in some other documents that I got that day was uh, uh, the outline of a, what I call a major fraud. In other words, light cigarettes are not safer than other cigarettes. And they said that in there. It said that. Yeah. He said they're more likely, to, the actual words uh, in the document said they're more, he said they're more likely to, to mislead the smoker than to provide value, useful information. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I found in those documents was uh, a statement that if we lower tar and nicotine too low, 
uh, smokers will be able to wean themselves from smoking. So I asked Mr. Rodgman, I said, uh, what did you mean by wean? And you could see him t twisting his hands and he said uh, in the deposition, Mr. Shelley, you know what I mean. And uh, they knew that if they lowered tar and nicotine l low enough, people would be able to wean themselves. But they also found ways to add uh, material uh, to the cigarettes so that the Cambridge filter couldn't even measure the tar and nicotine. It would dis make it so small, the particles, that it would go through the filter system. Mm -hmm. uh, there were so many tricks to the trade. And yet today, today, we still have light cigarettes out there. Most people, uh, are a large portion of people still smoke light cigarettes. And I assure you that if you ask most people, they still think they think it's healthier. for their health. Yeah, now you came up with an ingenious theory. Yeah about suing the manufacturers of these cigarettes. What was that theory? The theory was we have states, ha many states have st consumer protection statutes. And the statutes provide that if a product is sold and it's misrepresented, the consumers can sue to get their money back for the product. So, so instead of words, suing for a health care claim, right. we decided why not try class actions to get the money back for the cigarettes right. that they pay I, I thought that was very smart because what you're saying in essence is we agree that smoking is bad, but people are buying, consumers are buying these cigarettes because they think they are less bad right. and you're lying to them. Right. Right? That became it. And we, we lined up groups, lawyers in different states to work with us. One of the states, for example, was the state of Illinois, mm -hmm. and we uh, got a, a law firm, uh, Steve Tillery, and I went out to uh, St. Louis to uh, argue the case uh, with Steve to get a class certified. Mm -hmm. The judge who heard the case certified a class, which is very important. That means we can sue on behalf of all smokers yeah. who've smoked. In that particular case, it was Marlboro Lights cigarettes. And uh, for the all smokers of Marlboro Light, for the state of Illinois, in the state of Illinois, we the judge certified the class. We it's been battled. A case ended up with a ten billion dollar verdict, mm. which got overturned in a strange and suspicious manner, in my view, yeah. by the Illinois Supreme Court. Uh, I understand that uh, the case is still going on yeah, now. It's been revived. It's I been think. revived, yeah. and they're trying because to because supposedly the Illinois Sup State Supreme Court wasn't given all the information they needed to make a decision. Supp yeah. Now you have a similar case going on. There's a similar case going on in Minnesota. Isn't yeah, it? there's a case that we have as a class certified for the state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. That's up in the Minnesota Supreme Court, where the tobacco industry is trying to have that certification reversed. Now, as a result of your ingenious theory, the U.S. Department of Justice has taken a lot of this information and I think it was in they July. They pursued their yeah. own case using my theory. They won't, <laughs> frankly, they won't uh, say it was my theory, but yeah. it is. And uh, the material that we collected and they've uh, successfully been after the tobacco industry on that. However, uh, however, the courts uh, have been very difficult to deal with. They would not allow the FDA Really, the FDA should treat tobacco as a drug mm -hmm. and moder and require certain disclosures and take steps to eliminate certain aspects of what chemicals they put in. They're trying to do that. Uh, right now, there's a fight over the labels. They're trying to put labels on the cigarettes, pictures of what what they look like, and yeah. now some courts have uh, said, well, you can't do that. The tobacco, it's uh, interfering with freedom of speech. This has become the new game yeah. Uh, There's always a new legal theory so they can continue to sell the dangerous products. And the interesting thing is that why we're doing this show is that 1998, this is one of the myths that smoking and the tobacco industry had been curbed. It has not, has no, it? No, it hasn't. I, I'm very sad to see. Uh, you just go outside my building and you see people addicted to cigarettes taking breaks and smoking cigarettes. Uh, uh, the health care costs and the cost that a taxpayer immense. How do we change things, Steve? The way it's, it, I've been trying for years. I know you have. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, you, I, I sometimes st start to wonder, do I need an antidepressant, which I won't touch with <laughs> a 10-foot pole, because <laughs> they're, they're, they're particularly dangerous. Yeah. But I think the way we change things 
is we stop lying to ourselves and we put a stop to uh, this mis these misleading representations. Allowing them to sell these things deceptively. Yeah. We put a stop. Yeah. We make truth. You know, I think it was Justice Brandeis or Cardoso said sunlight is the best disinfectant. Mm -hmm. And right now, truthfulness is the best disinfectant yeah. that I can think of. And also recovery for smokers. In other words, right now, the only place you can really collect on a personal injury case for smoking is Florida. Mm -hmm. they have some very diligent lawyers did something that's the only state in the country yeah that I know of you know other than the Attorney General's cases and now the my light cigarette theory they're trying you know uh, it'll it'll take another generation <laughs> probably yeah. before those cases will bring fruit back to the taxpayers well the insider exclusive thanks you for all of your efforts and we thank you very much for appearing on this show because what you're doing is a benefit to every American thank you Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.